just ran upstairs, so she's on the she's on the couch. You can't see her. She's opposite me, so she's ready for poetry. So Wendy, we have four four and one dog. Um, what's the verdict? Well, let's officially start the program. This is our uh, Stockbridge Library Museum and Archives online poetry series called Medicine for the Soul. And the series started back in April for Poetry Month. John Gillespie, the president of our board, is a poetry fan and had the great idea to try to um, bring a little light to our dark times we were having back in March, April, May with everyone locked in at home. And now here we are mid-November and the series is still going. And it really does uh, bring, bring joy into our lives each week. And this week, we are lucky to have poet Stephen Leva with us. And Stephen was born in New Orleans and raised in Houston, Texas. He's joining us today from Baltimore. And his poems have appeared in or are forthcoming in Two Bridges Review, Scalawag, Nashville Review, Jubilat, Vinyl, Prairie Schooner, and the Best American Poetry of 2020. He is a Cape Canham Fellow and author of the chapbook Low Parish and author of the Understudies Handbook, which won the Gene Feldman Poetry Prize. Nice. Stephen holds an MFA from the University of Baltimore where he is an assistant professor in the Klein Family School of Communications Design. So I will turn the program over to you, John, and to you, Stephen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, no, it's great. This is a, a very special time each week. Um, so Stephen, we start out each, you know, probably the first eight minutes or so, just getting to know the poet. So. The first question is, you know, there have been so many themes uh, in 2020 and, and themes that continue. You know, the pandemic, uh, racial inequality or injustice, uh, economic unemployment, you know, uh, you know, a soaring stock market and then a sinking stock market. Um, you know, there's a vaccine, there's not a vaccine. How have some of those themes or have some of those themes, you know, start to work into your writing? You know, uh, it's a good question, John. I, I think a little bit about um, the way in which writing itself is both communal and solitary, right? Like you, you write alone um, in many ways, but uh, people read it, you know, it, it's part of a kind of bigger conversation. And if one thing 2020 has uh, brought to the surface is the ways in which we are both solitary and, and in need of community at the same time. Um, so broadly, I think, the tension between those two things, the, the tension between the responsibilities to the individual and responsibilities to uh, a larger community um, are often uh, things that I return to. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm also very sort of aware of the kinds of conversations that we have. Um, so there's a poem in the Understudies Handbook in which um, the protagonist from the Count of Monte Cristo, Edmond Dantes, um, uh, speaks to Freddie Gray, um, and I'm, I'm sure most people will know and recognize that name as the young man who had a rough ride from um, uh, police in Baltimore. Um, and I thought, well, what kind of conversations would those two figures, one, one real, one fictional, have um, about the kinds of injustices they experienced? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I both think about the individual, uh, the solitary and the communal, um, as a theme that I return to, and the kinds of conversations that we have with one another. Great, great. So, you know, it's always interesting, uh, you know, to me and, and others, is, is what triggers the beginning of a, a poem? Is it a conversation on the street? Is it writing notes, or you're reading something, or you're talking to a fellow poet? What, what kind of gets the, the poetic engine started? For me, it's many things. Um, I cannot deny that it's it's often reading. It's often being inspired by um, other works of literature. But my my sort of like lens of literature is really broad. It's everything from Dostoevsky to X Men comic books to um, you know uh, you know Black Panther films. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. so I, I I often begin with um, 
the, the poem usually begins with an engagement with another art form for me. Um, so like in Loperish, there's a, 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 a poem that I'm really proud of called Natural. Um, uh, began with me watching Zadiko videos of people dancing Zadiko. Um, and you know, there's the, the accordion is like that kind of like quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow became the metrical pattern in the poem that I wrote out, out of that. So, you know, it's kind of my, you know, it's, I begin with sound, you know, the, the euphony, just a pleasure of language and then the imagination that I'm often inspired by, by engaging with another art form. So uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, is a way is there a way that the the poem your poem tells you that it's complete? We've heard a lot of poets say that things are really, you know, being complete with a poem is is a is a is a nice dream, but not often a reality. <laughs> the poems keep kind of, uh, you know, changing themselves. I don't know, or changing the interpretation. Yeah, but you know, poems aren't finished; they're only abandoned. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think there's some wisdom in that. Um, it, in, in as much as um, if, if you take that approach, um, it, it puts you in a context by which you are listening to what the poem might be, rather than imposing what you think an int your particular intention is. You're not bending, you know, it's, it's what um, Richard Hugo says, it's like, you're not bending um, tr you know, music to truth, you're bending truth to music, right? So you're, yeah. you've gotta be listening to that music so that, mm -hmm as the truth evolves, it always sort of adheres to what the imagination might bring, um, you know, uh, but more practical, I mean, that, that can feel very like up here, you know, right. um, practically, uh, a, a rule I sort of set for myself is I don't, I, I don't think a, pen, a, a poem is finished for me until I've written something um, in which I have surprised myself, where something I didn't intend Right. happens, you know, um, a line, an image, a sound, a, a, an unexpected rhyme, a, um, a question that goes unanswered, something that that allows for surprise for me as the author, you know, because I often feel like if there's no surprise for me as the author, there's no surprise for the reader as well. Um, so that's a small like hurdle to, to get over. But, you know, poems not finished until, a, until something surprising has happened. No, that's great. I think I think that's a that's a really great way to look at it. So uh, that's the end of the uh, the Spanish Inquisition. We can <laughs> we can uh, no no we're this is always a favorite time for me. So now we get to listen to uh, you know some of your poetry. Great, I'd be be happy to read a little bit from the book. Um, uh, I'm going to start with a poem uh, that uh, is a sonnet. Um, there there are a number of sonnets in the uh, in the Understudies Handbook. Um, and they're a little, you know, they sort of bend, bend the form a bit. Uh, so they're not, they're not, you know, strictly adhering to all, all the rules, but um, they're 14 lines. Um, and I, I sort of think of them as Creole sonnets. Um, and this one's called Unmasking the Chorus. July doesn't beg. The cicadas are coughing through their timbles and couldn't care less whether anyone dreams of wings. Acquire a husk, they hum, like a cigarette hums, alone in an ash tray, tree, a sound that stretches like the skin of a snare drum, dunce. Abandon has its own bandwagon, and the confederacy of late summer's heat can't assuage. Boredom. The horizon sighs like a churchwarden pipe. I could die on this tree, the cicadas sing, coughing themselves rare and blue, like a husk of song, the lyrics, but not the tune. Um, you know, there's a, uh, there are, um, the first section of the, of the book is called um, Inside the Mouth of a Trumpet. Um, and every section sort of begins with uh, a quote by Wallace Stevens, um, but they also are sort of, uh, Wallace Stevens is uh, complicated and, and put in context by uh, a, a kind of answering quote by a, a black artist. Um, so inside the mouth of the trumpet, uh, the section begins with these two quotes. Um, and this is from Wallace Stevens uh, on modern poetry. It has to be living to learn the speech of the place. And then in response from Paul Robeson, 
um, famous black act actor from an essay he wrote called The New Idealism. It is not a question of who is the strongest, but what form of life is the strongest. Um, and I'll read the first poem in that section. It's called Primer. Um, it's about um, the place where I was born. There's no New Orleans, only the pauses between parades. The city christens its own, each palm leaf brushing our esplanade, a wet aspergillum. You will be known here as a gargoyle knows each inch of stone it sleeps in but cannot wipe its tears. What has all this iron wrought? Our family in toting Zotico means the accordion's broken back, means another fiddle's whip over catgut, means there is a balcony for everyone to die on. What is French about these quarters is exile. All gardens to the backyard. Son, remember to tell your sons. What whispers in the weary ear endlessly, come here, taste and taste, is an inability to sustain innocence. No, not quite. Something like feathers plucked from a mask. Um, and uh, there's a, you know, there's a, there, that first section is just really full of poems from New Orleans and about sort of um, the, the, the enduring magic of that, of that city. Um, so I'm going to read another poem that's set there um, called, called Ear Hustle. Um, and Ear Hustle is kind of a, a kind of idiom. It's a little bit of slang for eavesdropping. Ear Hustle, I love it. Yeah, right? Ear Hustle. Get down to the smallest birthright I cannot claim. Say beignets. And doesn't the stutter of hot oil start to sizzle on the small plates of memory? Faces powdered with sugar. No thought to whose ancestors cut which cane. Sing a hymn of mmm, mmm, mmm. Jackson Square hangs its portraits on the iron gates. And who can hold a horn note as long as the midday sun? Look up from that small plate in Cafe au lait and see the bent levees of language I cannot break. I will shame every shibboleth. And every house is lifted like a paused rapture. This cruelty and more fries the godhead in lard. Pour me a cup of chicory. A saxophone player cuts a canal through the breakfast din. Playing tank in the bangers, I gotta make a quick decision about how often I can be rescued. Neither I nor my children will ever ride the roller coasters at Jazzland, where a sign still hangs as it does in the heavens, will open after storm. Um, uh, and I'll just I'll just read um, I'll just read uh, <laughs> I'll read one more about um, uh, about childhood. Um, uh, so there's a poem in here called uh, a boondock, um, and it's a it's about the, the first person that I asked um, to dance. Um, maybe you can remember a time when, when you asked someone to dance and what that felt like. <laughs> a boondock. Lisa was the first girl in my life I asked to dance. I mean, a brass band was playing early jump blues, not a Lewis Jordan situation, but you know, the Andrews sisters, Bugle Boy and Company B, that business. Anyway, we were a shave under nine years old, two hearing kids in an American sign language performance group. And when we were done signing the lyrics to God Bless America, and after the polite applause of donors circled back into olives drowning in gin, the dance floor opened. I asked Lisa Colasso, she loved to say like cola company, to dance sheepishly, looking an inch above my glasses, thinking what would it be? to gently press my brown cheek to one of her freckles. I'll be damned if my desires will ever be that simple again. Her father was a Catholic from India. She had his features and dark hair, but her mother's Nebraskan complexion. I remember being afraid for no reason and my hand was shaking like I was signing applause. When she put it on her hip, lassoed my neck and we spun. I didn't know a waltz from a Roger Rabbit. All I could think is Scarecrow, Michael Jackson, I mean, ease, uh, imitate and ease on down the road. We rocked these blue as skylight t-shirts decorated with handprints. A fundraising situation for Be an Angel, this NGO founded by Lisa's family. 
my mama must have known it was going to be one of those fly in a bowl of milk moments. So she insisted my pants rest above my navel, shirt tucked, Vaseline like Yahweh's own glory across my forehead. Call me Moses at the foot of Sinai. My tablets, a pair of left feet. Just kidding, I was Gregory Hines in a Harlem night. And if we, if there was a golden clasp, Lisa and I were it. When Lisa moved, I moved. And just like that, we knew we'd never see a promised land. Instead of stones, the donors threw their eyebrows in the air, forgetting how colorblind they'd been before Jen. Mm. <laughs> um, actually, let me, let, me, let me do just one more. I, 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 this is kind of a, ha a habit for me um, and that I read the last poem in the book. Um, there, there are three poems in the, in the book called, um, they're all titled Anti-Confessional. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about, about what, is it, what does it mean to confess something um, in a poem uh, when it's an open secret, <laughs> you know, when, when, there's, when there is no secrecy, what, what does confession mean um, when everything's sort of out in the open? Um, and so uh, this, is, this is the last poem in the book. It's called Anti-Confessional Three. Um, and if you if you listen closely, you might hear uh, a little bit of uh, uh, 80s pop music um, uh, and a shout out to a song by Steve Winward. Anti-confessional three. This isn't a secret. I have failed to love with the patience of hibiscus root whose buds bloom with no thought of being tea. I have not loved my innocence overdressed in morning light. How can the earth keep turning to the thing that will kill it? Oh, sun, bring me a warm hill in August, an echo of a fragile and immortal green, a better remembrance of my grandma's eyes. I have failed to forget. Love is one of many higher choruses. And yes, there are octaves of light that linger. Can we still call love, love anymore? Or have we avoided failure? Every ode must fail if there is to be a higher love. Thank you <laughs> all so much. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, you know shout, shout out to um, uh, every version of that, whether it's Whitney Houston singing it or, um, or, you know, or Steve Winward him, himself. Yeah, Cynthia just said that's her favorite poem. Yeah, that's Cynthia Manning, a really fantastic uh, poet and friend who uh, gave me some excellent, excellent um, feedback on the manuscript when I was really struggling to find it, um, for it to find its soul. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she is absolutely instrumental um, and helped me get it to a place where um, a publisher would, would see, its, see what, what magic it's bringing. And, and what year was that? Oh, so um, this was uh, accepted. I, I got the call from Washington Writers Publishing House um, uh, in January of 2020. Um, who knew what, what we were in, in store for? Um, uh, but, you know, I was, I was delighted. And I had been, like, I think I, meant, I may have mentioned it before, but I was working, I had been working on the book for seven years. So how's that for biblical? Um, and, uh, you know, it, it ended up being um, a pretty tight uh, turnaround in terms of production schedule. So I got the call in January and they said, we we're gonna publish in October. You know, so we're talking 10 months um, when some uh, publication schedules are as much as two years. Um, so, but I was, I was so elated and so glad to be working with a press that's also a co-op. Um, so the way that Washington Writers Publishing House works is every, person who works for the press is also a published author on the press. And then the roles of um, responsibility rotate from year to year. Um, so I'm, you know, it, it felt very egalitarian. And that, that was like uh, the kind of thing that felt um, like a safe place for, for these poems to shine. No, that's great. Yeah, and I thought your anti-confessional was going to be like your second dance with Lisa or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was going to be a revelation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a fair amount of, um, you know, there's, there, there, are, there are a couple of poems in here where dancing is sort of centered. Um, 
there's a poem, the poem that was in Best American Poetry um, is actually about a middle school dance. So the poem that I read, A Boondock, I was probably about um, nine, you know, nine years old, you know, asking someone to dance for the first time. Um, and if you can imagine it, it was really like, you know, it, you know, the highest waist pants, because my mom was insisting, you know, like the shiniest shoes, you know, at the time I wasn't wearing contacts, so really big glasses. Um, for some reason at nine years old, I, I never had a haircut, you know? So despite all of those things, you know, this friend who I had known since we were five um, agreed to dance um, with me. Um, but we were, they, we were literally, they, they literally had like a jazz, you know, band singing Bugle Boy and Company B. You know, the Bugle Woogie, Bugle Boy and Company yeah. B. Is that, is that business, you know? Um, and no one else was on the dance floor except for, you know, this, this, these two, you know, this, this, we were, bo we're both mixed race, right? But she is sort of white presenting. Um, uh, and I'm obviously, uh, you know, sort of black presenting. So what, what we were on that dance floor and how we were being observed, right? In some ways is very, is a lot of what the Understanding's Handbook tries to tackle, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, what are we, what were we being prepared for while in, in the gaze of everyone else, you know, we, we could already like sense resistance, you know, <laughs> we could sense, sense that, hey, you know, this is all well and good while you're nine and in five years, we ain't having it, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, if there, you know, it, I don't know how much revelation there is in the book, but there's a, there's a lot of questions being asked about what kind of roles are we prepared to play and which roles are we prepared to play um, and then not allowed to. So let me just ask you one more question about that. So what, it, was there a surprise in that poem for you that came out? Um, in, um, in, in the in, one about Lisa? Confessional Three? Oh, in Anti-Confessional Three? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you, you know, like, so, I mean, I, 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 if I were to tell you the process behind it, um, I, I, I was just like weeping and weeping. It's a late, it was a poem that was written late, I, I should say, um, really late in the process of the book. Um, uh, and I had been listening to a cover of Steve Winward's Higher Love um, by a guy whose name I can't remember, but it was very stripped down, only piano, right? And I actually just heard it on a commercial. And it's really like, I mean, this guy is in the pit, right? He's like in the, the depths of, of emotional like things, you know? So when he's saying like, think about it, there must be higher love. There's none of the fanfare of the eighties music. There's none of the synthesizer. It's just like piano. Uh, and something about it just broke me. I was just weeping and weeping, you know, about um, like in the car on the way to work, you know, it was, it was unreasonable, <laughs> you know, um, and it made me think about, you know, what we don't write about very often um, is our own despair um, in, in a way that is um, not necessarily coded and performative, but in a way that just simply says, I'm, I failed. You know, how many poems have you, have you written, have you read in which, you know, the thesis is sort of, I failed, but not what I learned from it, just simply I failed, <laughs> you know, um, and how much has that been missing from the conversation in 2020 is someone admitting, just admitting, like, I didn't do it, I didn't make, I didn't, it didn't happen, right, it wasn't, you know, we didn't get across the mark, um, and so the, the surprise, I'm, it, you know, to answer your question, the surprise for me in the poem mm -hmm was um, that image of, um, you know, I have not loved with the patience of hibiscus roots whose yeah. buds bloom with no thought of being tea. I was like, what, 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 that, that was new to me, you know? I'm, I'm not usually making hibiscus tea <laughs> or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but that idea of that kind of patience. Um, Bye, Cynthia, um, is what was, what was the surprise. And so everything just sort of flowed um, from that that image of what does it mean to say I have not loved with a certain kind of patience and, and what might that what might that yield? That's such a great line. That line will stick with you for sure. Right? Yeah. As, as will a lot of you know patience. Yeah, the line's great because it feels like you know, love is like the natural order of things. It's a hibiscus, you know, the whole thing is it's not like you know, the hibiscus doesn't have like, you know, four like sub tab options to, I want to grow halfway. I want to, you know, the whole thing is it just grows. So mm -hmm. I, I know it was, it was a very, it was a great image. 
is a great image. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I and I'm and I'm interested in that, right? I'm interested in, um, you know, the things that we go around and around avoiding talking about, right? Um, you know, um, and uh, you know, it, it's not easy to write. <laughs> it's not easy to write about, you know, the the places in where where we have been lacking. You know, I, I mean, I think I've uh, is it uh, James Wright. You know, his famous poem ending with, I have wasted my life, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like image, 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 I, I have wasted my life, you know, lying in a hammock is, it's got a long title, but it's like lying in a hammock is the beginning of it, that title. Yeah. Um, uh, and it, that was probably also in my mind, too, is, is thinking about how do you arrive at something that feels earned like that, you know, yeah. like, not, not having that feel modeling. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You know, your first poem, um, can you, am I, you, am you oh, can. Oh, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it, I don't remember, sorry, I, I don't remember its title, but um, there was a huge amount of metaphor in there, just mm -hmm. something I'm sort of naturally inclined to, but struggling with. So I'd love you to talk just a little bit about how you, brought in a lot of disparate, in a way, metaphor into that poem. Yeah, yeah, unmasking the chorus, yeah. Um, actually, yeah. I'll, I'll talk about that and then I'll, I'll read you a short poem too that in which there is ex extended, just one like simple extended metaphor. Okay. Um, but, you know, regarding metaphor, I think it's one thing, um, I, I, I really agree with um, um, uh, this uh, scholar named Richard, El Richard Eldridge um, and, uh, and the poet Robert Pinsky, both of whom are saying that in order for you to um, uh, really uh, turn an experience into art, you have to transform it first. So like the first impulse of a, a, a writer, a poet, or any kind of artist is to transform experience, and that that act of transformation is actually an agent of clarity. So it doesn't, it's not meant to obscure what happened, it's meant to make what happened more real, you know, like, I mean, if you want to use like religious language, it's a kind of incarnation, right? It's a, it's more, it's like super real. Um, and so it's a, it, thinking about metaphor as an agent of clarity um, let, is something that I thought of, well, that, that ties everybody together, right? Metaphor is one thing that everybody from different, like poetic traditions, different languages, different, um, you know, centuries, right? Metaphor is this unifying force. Um, and so I was, I was, I was thinking a lot about cicadas as a kind of signifier for the South in America, in, in the American South for for Louisiana, um, and you know, often when I would read about cicadas in literature, they have this sort of um, triumphant, you know, um, presentation, <laughs> you know, and and I'm like, I'm like, and often they're given a kind of agency, you know, like sometimes talking to us. And I think for me, I, I began thinking about those disparate metaphors by thinking cicadas don't care about any of us. You know? <laughs> they do not care. They do not care whether or not you also find freedom. You know, they, they are just like, you know, you better look, the best you can do is get a husk, you know. <laughs> um, but to be honest, you know, it's funny, you know, it's funny about that is um, uh, I had written a version of the poem and talking about cicadas, about their singing and all that, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, obviously there's, there is some association with them being on a tree, dying on a tree, how you might inflect from that, uh, the history of racial um, trauma in America. Um, but um, there was a line that came really late in the revisions that just simply said, July doesn't beg. It's just an opening, you know, kind of a, a sasura, you know, just half a you know, small sentence in the first line mm -hmm. that's, you know, with some enjambment. And I was like, man, that's fascinating to me. Like, what does that, what does that mean? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you know, but, and it, but it fit with that idea of um, cicadas don't care. They don't, you know, they're indifferent um, to uh, what, what, what we might make metaphors of them, you know? Um, and so that, that's part of it was, I was able to unlock it by thinking, by instead of using the cicadas to say something I wanted to say, thinking about th giving them a kind of different kind of agency. And it was one of, you know, we will probably out, yeah, indifference. They're just yeah. like, well, we will, you know, 
I, I'm not going to beg to be your triumphant metaphor. Um, I am, you know, this process and you're probably in process too and don't recognize it is, is kind of the idea. Um, but let me, let me read you this, this poem really quickly um, sure. called, called Supremacy. Um, either you or any of you play badminton or watch badminton. Um, I, so the, I have, no, no, but I, I read this poem and I love it. And I'm so excited to hear you read it. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so this is this is a poem that's kind of built on um, the the me a, a, a badminton metaphor, but uh, obviously you'll um, you'll hear that it's it's about it's always about something else. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, I have to go to the table of contents um, really quickly. Forty nine. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's a good. I think it's a good example of what what way, the way that you know if. If unmasking the chorus use disparate metaphors, this one is like one commitment to one metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, su supremacy. Consider the shuttlecock, its deft lightness, its rubber nose unbent, its attention to racket, its fear of the ground, its willingness to lob or smash its whiteness, its penchant for being held afloat by the slightest breeze and histories of swing, how it needs to be batted between two players, how it recognizes their want. Consider its feathers, its plastic, its conical shape suggesting hierarchy, and always its weight in your hand, how it seeks to be served. You know, so <laughs> there you go. You know, both bo both can sort of yield, <laughs> you know, different kinds of things, but that that's also a, a that is the one time in my, you know, many, many years of writing poems, you know, 15 years of, of writing poems um, in which a poem came almost fully formed. Mm -hmm. um, like woke, literally was having a midday nap, crazy dreams I can't remember, woke up and the poem was just, just was, was there, you know, sort of in my lap. Um, and, you know, that is so incredibly rare, you know, that I just, I didn't question it, <laughs> um, but yeah. So th th is that is that helpful or? Yeah. Did I? Yes. Thank you very much. That's great because I'm struggling around those multiple metaphors within one poem versus metaphor through. I, there are no rules. I mean, I so so that's great. And and by the way, I love Steve Winwood's Higher Ground. I think he's among the most spiritual singers, and mm -hmm. you know, he's he's got incredible. Yeah, yeah, higher love is great. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fun, such a fun, um, such a fun song. Um, and yeah, I mean, the thing I would say, just lastly, to button it up about metaphor, is simply the best advice that I ever got about it is that figurative language and metaphor being one of them is is meant to help us see something more clearly. Uh, it's it's meant to help us um, experience something. It's the it's the liter I mean, literally a vehicle, you know. Um, for one heart to connect to another one. Um, and so if I keep that in the forefront of my mind, rather than using it to code or obscure what I'm really trying to say, um, yeah. it's, a, it's a method of saying what I really mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> rather than hiding it. Um, and I think that's the key. So and if, you, if that is what's happening, then whether or not you're mixing metaphors or whether or not there's, you know, it's like, in some ways doesn't matter <laughs> because mixed metaphors, the problem with that is the, the confusion, right? The un, the un, um, the uninteresting ambiguity, right? But if you begin with them as agents of clarity, then, then you know, you'll find you'll you'll be surprised how much people don't care about whether that the, the metaphor is mixed as long as it's interesting. <laughs> Great, interesting and clear, yeah. Um, cool. And before I forget, make sure to say hello to Dora Malik. I oh, I will. Oh, yeah, Dora's great. Yeah, yeah, Dora, yeah she's... Dora was our, our our second speaker on April 29th. And yeah, uh, she was uh, uh, in Stockbridge. We have the uh, Amy Clampett House, and Dora, I think, was was a, uh, a resident back in 2017, a Clampett Fellow. Okay, so one of the women in Lennox, a poet. Um, and then uh, Sarah Trudgeon, our, our, another poet that, that helped us kind of get going, we kicked it off with the Clampett, the Clampett alumni group and uh, we went from there and expanded it. 
Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd really recommend uh, for everyone, both people who are watching later and, and, and you all, um, Dora's new book, Flourish. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Dora's work um, from way back when, when she had a, a book called uh, Shore, o- Shore Ordered Ocean. Um, but uh, for, you know, this, this latest one is just really, really excellent. Can't, can't recommend it highly enough. Um, okay. And I think she did the, uh, I, Wendy, I'd have to go back to the video, but I think it was our, our first kitchen table office video. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. We've had a lot of bedroom videos. We've had uh, out on the porch. Uh, mm. that, that was our first, uh, hey, my kitchen's now part of my work office. So. Yeah. Yeah. Even, yeah. I let mean, me ask you, what do you, if I can just mm-hmm. one more question, mm-hmm. how would you be, uh, is there an instructional or guidance theme for your students, you know, in terms of how they approach, you know, do you do that or are you basically teaching them elements of, I'm just trying to figure out. How like how do, how do I, how do I kind of invite them into the. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do, how, do, how do they, you get them to start entering that dimension? You know, well, I, I start off by telling them something that Richard Hugo says in the triggering town. Um, and I say, look, I can only really teach you to teach to. I can only really teach you to write like me, but I am I am assuming that your bullshit meter is raised high and that you're accepting that which works for you and jettisoning the things that don't work for you. Um, and in that, right, there is no um, presumption of me as an ultimate authority. Um, but I can then also speak out of my own expertise, yeah. right? So it's it's a way of kind of navigating. Um, some students uh, maybe reflexive resistance to the idea of subjectivity, right? Um, subject, not all subject subjectivities are equal, <laughs> um, and but but it's it's saying I'm not I'm not present and nothing I'm presenting is gospel, you know. It's it's simply methods you might try, um, and what you need to figure out is how what I'm hoping you learn is how to write like you. You know, in it, like through me trying to 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 cert, you know, present to you how how I write. Um, so I I start with that idea, you know, um, that you know there are rules, but the rules by which you must adapt and synthesize them um, to uh, to a process that's evolving, that you are in, that you are dynamic, right? So I it, more, but more practically, right? More practically, I try to tell them I like things like I don't. I don't begin in ideas, you know, um, and I'm not like full um, William Carlos Williams. I'm not talking about no ideas, but in things, <laughs> you know, I just simply mean that I be, I try to get them to have a relationship with language first, rather than a relationship with content, um, because I, I want them to um, avoid being didactic and avoid putting as the primary value that they have communicated well. Um, because, you know, I, you know, and this is borrowing from a, a, another teacher, you know, the guy on the street corner who's just yelling, right, is communicating pretty well. There is no, you know, there's no, mis- so often no misunderstanding about the emotion, right, that's being there. But is that something you want to read or hear again and again and again? And if not, why is that, right? Um, I would say that it's because it hasn't gone through that act of transformation that makes it art, um, you know, to bring it back to what Robert Pinsky was sort of um, suggesting. Um, so one way to get them to, to, de, um, to reframe that, their process a bit is I get them to think about, just, just tell me words you find, um, that, that you find euphony in, that you find pleasurable sounds in, and make a list of words that just really sound good to you, and make a poem out of that. Yeah. Um, and in that, you don't have any known destination. Right, you're not trying to say something about the Trump presidency. You're not trying to say something about, you know, these big ideas. Or, or as Richard Hugo says, you're not trying to sit, write a poem about something that should have a poem written about it. He says those always turn out badly. <laughs> um, <laughs> or, you know, but 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 it doesn't mean that those things are off limits. It's the it's it's the way that we get there, right? So you can t- write about those things, but if it's through language that is beautiful, right? Um, you can say anything. And I, and I tell them, I'm like, look, it's unlikely, it's not, it's not wholesale true, but it's, it's unlikely that you're going to write about a topic that I have not read about before. You know, at a certain point, you know, as, as a reader, you, have, you, you realize, right, there are 
major themes that get repeated, repeated. There are master plots, there are structures that just happen again and again and again. But I'm not concerned with that because I, I, I don't think that, um, I, I think there's a very like sort of like um, capitalist um, mythos around like being unique. Um, and that makes people like think I can't write about anything that someone has already written about or I shouldn't write about that. There are tons of poems about that. Um, it, rather than thinking about what can I add to the to the great chorus of those things. Um, and, you know, I, so I have my students begin in sound, um, which is my process as well. And then I, I, I invite them into seeing what that might yield. Uh, and then we just, we work, we work and we work from there. Um, I always have one assignment where I have the students write a poem where they can't use any pronouns um, because I often see as a kind of like habit, um, the substitution of the pronoun without an antecedent um, causing ambiguity. Right, and so if you just you know put in what that noun might be, not only will you tighten syntax, but you'll also um, include specificity. Right, so we're we're reducing vagueness, we're increasing specificity, and raising the potential right for interesting sounds to happen. It's the difference between saying the city and saying New York City. Right, <laughs> like those things like immediately conjure different images and have different sonic play. So it, I mean, often that's my my process is trying to find interesting ways to invite them into having a relationship with language rather than a relationship with ideas. That, that's Thanks. actually reassuring because when I'm revising, I'm taking pronouns out right and left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, some of it, I mean, not to get too wonky, but like some of it is, you know, if you do that uh, and along with like kind of thinking about the way that prepositional phrases are happening, you'll often find that active voice comes up right, rather than passive voice constructions. Right. Um, but if I start to say, like, don't use passive voice in your poems, what I will get from students is why not? You know, I will just get the like reflexive contrarianism of I want to just do the thing that my professor told me not to do, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, I, you know, if I, I try to hack all that by, by presenting to them it not as rules, but rather um, an invitation to play um, and, and what that play might yield. So I'm just trying to build the walls to the sandbox and then let them build castles, <laughs> you know? Nice, hey. nice. <laughs> yeah, we probably haven't spent as much time with, with uh, you know, a bunch of our poets who are, who are, are you know, college teachers about the process, but that, that really is, is just, uh, you know, for me, just another great re revelation insight to how you work and how, how you think about poetry. So, you know, thanks for sharing that. That, that was really great. Yeah, it's the, you know, I mean, there is, I also try to approach it with humility and just say, you know, I don't try to assume that I can be a better teacher than the canon, you know, um, but I also try to tell my students there are multiple canons, <laughs> you know, yeah. the biggest thing you can do is just read and read and read and read and read because they are, they are, the poems themselves are pretty excellent teachers if you listen to them. Um, uh, and if you fall in love with, with them, right? Not to be romanticizing it, but you know, if you learn to love them, not for what they, um, not for what they might do for you, but as pleasure unto themselves, um, you know, um, I think, you know, that's that's just. But you know, in the end, what does it matter? <laughs> you know, what does it matter what your poetics are if you make a good poem? <laughs> so, Stephen, I'm just yeah. curious if. Mm -hmm. um, you have particular poets that you turn to, you know, what you say, just read, read, read. Are there particular poets that you read for inspiration? Absolutely. Um, so two things, there's a couple of things I'm always keeping in mind. I want my reading to be balanced across time. Um, so I want just as, I want to make sure that as much contemporary poetry that I'm reading, I'm also reading poetry from the mid 20th century and then um, poetry from you know, um, the, the 19th, 18th and, and, and on back. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, for I read contemporary poets to think about what kind of conversations are happening and how I'm participating in them, you know? You know, I, re I read, you know, I read those mid 20th century poets like Robert Lowell and, you know, Sylvia Plath and, and you know, I, I read, uh, or, you know, Gwendolyn Brooks um, to, really, to really sort of get engaged with, um, 
what they're doing in, in language, you know, like what they're doing with the sonnet, how they're transforming things, how they're in these, these liminal spaces and making art out of words, you know, in, in them. Um, and, you know, then I read folks like Keats to disrupt my diction, you know, because they're, they're always going to be writing an addiction that I can't access. Um, and, it, it, and, you know, because it's not the normal speech of the day. Um, and that then renews my English. You know, so it's almost like doing translation, you know, from English to English, you know, but because I'm not bilingual, I can only do that by reaching for a diction that is different, but in a language I still understand. And then how do I take that idea um, you know, like, like that, that kind of dome sepulcher image and Ode to a West Wind, right, might become the Gulf of Mexico in a poem about New Orleans, right? And it's, but I, I couldn't get that image, I couldn't get that diction um, to make that kind of combination if I didn't reach outside of the kind of lacuna of, of contemporary poetry. But, but the idea is that there are no hierarchies, that they're all put in conversation with one another. But I, I, I make my reading very broad. But, you know, Walcott, um, Plath, Gwendolyn Brooks, um, you know, Keats, um, Sappho, uh, to reach, you know, way back, um, contemporary poets like Terrence Hayes, um, Cynthia, who was, who was just on here, she's got a book called Blue Hallelujahs, um, uh, Ilya Kaminsky's, uh, both Death Republic and Dancing in Odessa, those, those were like revelatory, um, books for me, um, yeah, I mean, uh, li there's a great book called Open Interval by Ly Lyrae Van Cleef Stefan, and she's a professor at Cor Cornell. Yeah. Um, um, some of you might know her. Uh, oh, just really, really great um, um, poems uh, that imagination. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, I heard, I heard the, the writer Teju Cole, um, author of Open City, say, when it comes to influences, when it comes to reading, the most important thing is that they be broad, you know, that you, you, you that you're drawing from many wells. And I, I've always extrapolated that to mean and extend to then other other art forms. But in terms of like um, other reading, th those are a few um, of them. Luis Gluck, you know, just won the Nobel. You know, is there is there anything more like, gosh, wow, than at, you know, at the end of my suffering. There was a door. <laughs> like, I mean, that, that, I mean, you could stay, uh, you know, if I were a philosopher, you know, you could stay lingering, ex you know, e explicating that for eternity. <laughs> um, you know, but it's just such a powerful, it's a, it's a, it's such a powerful thing that language could do, you know. Um, you know, so yeah, she, she was, she was really the wild iris, you know, which is what that's from, that book um, was really important to me as well. Mm. Well, so that was like a that was like a kaleidoscope of no, suggestions. No, 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 no. It was great. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 some of our most interesting conversations have been in addition to the poems actually being read. Mm -hmm. It's just been just some, you know, tremendous insights into the you know just the things you've talked about. So it's 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 uh, as I said, this is. Uh, you know, every Wednesday, it's kind of like an anchor on my calendar. And sometimes that anchor yeah. can uh, to drag me down into the sea. But then yeah. at the end of every Wednesday at like either two o'clock or now three o'clock, I'm like, Wendy knows, I'm like, I'm going to go run a marathon now. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Marathon. You know, uh, maybe, maybe we can just, we can end on this. Um, yeah. you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a poem by Derek Walcott called Sea Grapes. Um, and I'll just, you know, that poem is really fascinating to me because it opens with a line that says the sail, you know, like a, like a ship, um, the sail, which leans on light, um, uh, which is, you know, a, a fantastic image. Um, and it ends with um, the classics can console, but not enough. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and I often tell my students that I was like, we need you all. We need your voices. We need you to write more and more. Uh, and you know why? Because the classics, the classics can console, but not enough. <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, that's my that's my sort of like fit, yeah. I, that's a kind of maxim I return to that keeps me writing. Um, oh, really great. So, Gail, Gail, you got your homework. Well, yeah, I've yeah. Got, I've got my homework. This was a, a total pleasure. 
and and a lot of learning. Thank you. Happy to do it. You know, I hope I hope you know there's some there's some light in those poems for you all, and you know, and hope you know people get a chance to to watch it and learn about Stockbridge and what they're doing at the library. Yeah, no, that's great. No, thank you again for sharing your time with us and and uh, what a fantastic hour. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. I'm going to hop off. Okay. It's okay. been a pleasure. Bye. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yep. Thank you, Gail. Gail, I hope to see you someday in the near